G'day ladies and gents and welcome back to Star Citizen with Mags and welcome to Star Citizen 3.0. Well, kind of. This is the Star Citizen 3.0 PTU or Public Test Universe. For those of you who are unfamiliar with how uh, SIG does its internal testing, it starts off with an internal build for the developers only, then it goes to a special private build that's available for Evercardi members. Evercardi, or the Avocados, are players who have done a lot of bug reports and are hand-selected by SIG to play around in the first release of a patch. I say play, but as a general rule, they're given set tasks to achieve within the universe and they have to follow them while SIG is monitoring to check for bugs and so on and so forth. Then it goes to the PTU. The public test universe is where the build is opened up to a wider selection of players. In the case of the 3.0 test, it was opened up to Evercardi members first, then subscribers were allowed access to it, and concierge members, so players were spent in excess of $1,000. Once they have gone through and done bulk testing on the servers in the PTU and all of the final bugs are sorted out, a release candidate is built and that goes to live. Now the PTU does not include everything that 3.0 will contain, but a limited selection based on the things that SIG currently needs tested. And being as it is a test build, it is buggy. There is glitches, you'll get some frame rate drops, things are still being worked on in here. So a smooth experience is not to be expected, but that's what happens when you're on any kind of test build. And it does have some other niceties, such as having virtually every single flyable ship that is currently available, available for players to use. So anyways, today we are taking up the Cutlass Black and we are going to fly to Daymar. And this is the new startup system, so we've just turned power on and engines on. Your systems are online. Now you'll notice when the engine's turned on, the ship's sort of jolted up a little bit. The new Cutlass Black features the new suspension system that is going into all the ships in Star Citizen. That is, uh, it's a little bit spongier, it makes landings a little bit smoother rather than trying to dock a brick with a brick. So, what else is new about the Cutlass Black? Well, everything, for starters, is looking at the the HUD and uh, the console setup here, you can see it is significantly different from the old one. You'll also notice how the seats now raise into the cockpit from a lowered position, meaning that it's impossible for the pilot to actually get trapped in behind the co-pilot when two people are actually manning the ship. The turret's mounted a little bit higher, there's now a sort of a forward living area behind the cockpit directly with the bunks in it, as well as access to the turret, as well as having the cargo area at the back. And the Cutlass Black has gotten big. Some nice face animations there as well. And there is no character customization available in the game at this time, you're just given a default face. But it's a nice example of what these faces actually look like. And of course Crusaders had a little bit of an overhaul. In fact, space in general has had a bit of an overhaul. It's a lot more colourful now. The lighting has definitely been adjusted in 3.0. And here you can have a bit of a look-see as to why there is a bit of a lag going on around Port Olisar. There is a lot of players out and most of these are trying to bring out large ships. What was actually going on is people wanted to fly to the planets and they wanted to take a big ship which is understandable, I get that. And they wanted to put, you know, space bikes. You know, we're talking about the Dragonflies or the Nox, they're all available now. Or in the cases some were trying to spawn in the Aquila, which doesn't spawn with the Ursa Rover in the cargo bay. So trying to get the Ursa Rover inside of the ship. And doing this while being at the primary entry point for every single person trying to log onto the server all at once. This was a bad idea. Uh, the quantum drive effects have changed. I'll uh, just be quiet and let this one run through. Now there was actually a sound glitch there. It was supposed to be a spooling up sound playing during that initial launch, but again, PTU. But anyways, as I was saying, people were trying to spawn in multiple large ships as well as spawning in the transports that they wanted in those ships and trying to get the two together in Port Olisar while people were trying to log in and it just lagged the hell out of Port Oli. It was, um, yeah, basically log in, get on the ship and get the hell out of there. As for how you actually get the bikes into your ships, well it's actually really easy. Down here on the planet you'll see these little uh, nav markers. Now we're going to fly, this is actually my first time landing on a planet on this approach by the way. So I just picked a spot, um, the closest one that was available, which is an emergency shelter, which we'll be checking out towards the end of this video. 
but all over the planet there are small sites, mining sites, there is hydroponic sites, there's these emergency sites. Some of these have spawn in capability much like Port Olisa does. So you fly to one of the bases on the planet that has the ability to spawn in units, you land your ship there and then you spawn in a Dragonfly or an Ursa Rover or whatever else and load them into your ship and it's very smooth. Works extremely well. I ended up putting in a Dragonfly yellow jacket in the back of this by the end of my flyout. You won't see it in this video, but you'll probably see it in a future one. And it went in very, very, very nicely. No problems at all. But again, I was doing it on the planet and not at Port Olisar. Anyways, we are on approach to Daymar. Now, I have condensed the approach to Daymar quite a bit. Basically how it works in Star Citizen, or at least how it works in the 3.0 PTU, may change in the future. The Quantum Drive will bring you to the edge of the planet or moon's gravity well. And that's where it drops you off. At that point, you have to slow boat it in. Now, you can come in just on normal engines, which you can see at the moment, we're doing about 220 meters per second on approach to the moon. Or you can fire up the afterburners, which will get you up, well, it depends on ship on how fast they go. The Cutlass Black gets up to about uh, 1,150 meters per second on full burn. Now, if you use the afterburner, you consume fuel. And that fuel doesn't regen, you'll need to go to somewhere and actually get that refueled. So you've got to make a little bit of a choice. I spent about half my time slow boating in, and then I did about a five minute burn on afterburn to approach the planet a little bit quicker. Um, by the time I hit the atmosphere, it took me about 15 minutes, and then there was about another five to six minutes through the atmosphere itself to actually get to a point where you could clearly see the terrain. It is a big fly-in, but it is also worth noting that you don't just go to these planets to go to a point, well, unless you're doing a delivery run, of course. As a general rule, flying in here, I entered this the, uh, the atmosphere of Daymar, and I spent the next three and a half hours on the planet, and I feel like I explored next to nothing. This place, it boggles the mind how big these moons are. They are huge. So at this point, just inverting the ship so we can have a little bit of a look at the terrain through the top of the window, because it's a bit clearer. Now you remember the draw distances on Star Citizen are so long as to almost be non-existent. Everything down there is a place you can fly to. It's not a placeholder that is the actual surface of the planet. If I was to pull down right now, we could track one of those spots all the way in until we could eventually land on it. And we've just hit the atmosphere. Now, of course, the re-entry effect is happening in a cone in front of the ship because you are not re-entering off the hull. The thermal shock wave is actually coming off the forward shield. Now that, that period there actually lasted about two minutes in total before we broke through it and we're starting to get into the atmosphere. Now, as I said, the atmosphere on Daymar is actually thicker than here on Earth. It's about 1.4 standard atmospheres, at least as far as I've been able to tell according to the Moby Glass. And once you got into the atmosphere, I could feel the ship being buffeted. It did feel sluggish, not as responsive as it was before. There was definitely a bit of drag happening in regards to the atmospheric flight model. It still doesn't feel like an aircraft, but then again, I'm not really flying an aircraft, so I'm not entirely sure what this should feel like. But there was definitely a noticeable change between space and the atmosphere. Now, one complaint I did have here is that we need a higher contrast HUD and possibly some kind of ground track radar in these ships. As you can see, I've entered the atmosphere of Daymar directly into a dust storm. Now, the effect here is absolutely beautiful. The dust storm effect, very convincing. I do very much like it. But because of the light coming through the dust, it's almost the same color as the HUD overlay, and it's extremely light. Now, between the nav points being in a very light green and the HUD elements being in almost the same cream as the dust, I can't read my HUD at the moment, which means at the moment I cannot see the ladder, so I'm not entirely sure what my pitch angle is while I'm flying. I'm sort of flying on guesswork. And there is two, when you enter an atmosphere, there is two new uh, HUD markers that pop up. One shows current altitude, which is very important, obviously, if you don't want to hit the deck. The second one is maximum safe speed at this altitude. Exceeding it will actually damage your ship. These are two things that I really need to know, and unless I zoom in on the HUD or angle the ship in such a way that I can get a little bit of contrast against them, 
I cannot read these HUD elements, which is incredibly important. Now, a ground track radar would be nice as well, because obviously we are flying through a dust storm. Weather effects are clearly going to be a thing on the moons and planets. My visibility at the moment, again, as I said, is garbage. It looks beautiful. It should be but I still can't see. So maybe on one of these screens have the option to flick up a ground track radar that gives just a, a, a wireframe of the terrain moving in front of the spaceship for say half a kilometer. So you get a little bit of an idea of exactly what you're flying over. It could be a useful thing if the sensor package is to put in. Now in regards to the HUD coloring, it doesn't have to be any kind of fancy adaptable HUD and that is a really nice shot. Sorry, it still blows me away how good this actually looked. And once I got away from Port Olisar, as a general rule, the frame rates weren't too bad. There were moments where they did dip low while I was in flight, but as a general rule, I had the frame rate at about 30. Sometimes it got a little bit higher. It was, it was all right. Anyways, the HUD. Um, a simple switch to invert the colors would probably be all that was needed. So right now the HUD is nice and light. It's perfectly fine for space. It's extremely high visibility hit a button inside of the cockpit, inverts the colors and switches all the HUD elements to black and maybe red for the nav points and instantly I can actually see what's going on. And there we are. So we've just pulled the ship into a hover. Now this is the Wolf Point Emergency Shelter. From my approach from Crusader and from Port Olisar, this was literally the closest marked landing point that I could actually find. So I figured it would be the first place to actually go. Landing gear deployed. I'm just trying to have a look at the corner window here because there is another ship down here and I'm just trying to spot a nice clear place to put this thing down. It is surprisingly large. The Cutlass Black got very big. It is a giant space Huey now and I love that, but it is much larger than it once was. That being said, um, I did have access to one in the, the live servers, but I don't actually own one. I'm honestly thinking I might actually buy one of these now. This thing is a lot of fun to fly around. I've really been enjoying it. Anyway, just lowering ourselves onto the surface. I made sure we were zero lined before I brought us down and you'll see the suspension at work here. Uneven terrain, the new squishy suspension does the job nicely and we're landed. And that is the emergency shelter. Now, what these emergency shelters are, they're dotted all around the moons um, of Crusader, and they will be dotted around other planets as well, specifically on planets that have hostile environments. What they are is, well, exactly what they sound like. If something goes wrong, should you crash your ship, should you find yourself in a situation where you are trapped on the surface, you have a limited amount of oxygen, obviously the atmosphere of Daymar is not breathable. So you need to find somewhere where you can survive. These emergency shelters will have oxygen supplies, medical supplies on board, and the ability to communicate with the outside world. So that's literally what they are, a place to run to when everything goes wrong. Hopefully, if something goes wrong, you're gonna be close enough to one of them to actually make it. Alternatively, if your ship's been severely damaged and isn't gonna be able to get to its next destination, you can land at one of these and basically wait for a pickup. And my first time on the surface of a planet. Or of a moon. I keep calling it a planet, it's a moon. Now it took me a little second here to work out exactly how to close the hatch on the Cutlass Black. I thought it might be the same panel that I used to open it, but as it turns out, you just look directly into the back of the cargo hold and bring up the interaction mode, and it immediately gives you the highlight. There it is there. So just click. Now that is a Buccaneer, so that is a ship that somebody has brought in as a backup. The Buccaneer, as far as I'm aware, wasn't actually available. It's one of the few flyable ships that wasn't available for PTU testers. So the only people that have them are the people that bought them. And hello, we have a person. I have no idea what this guy was trying to do. He wasn't trying to talk to me in chat. He wasn't giving me any hand signals. He was just sort of running around. Anyways, these are the planetary outposts. So this is an incredibly small planetary outpost. I've actually been to a couple since recording this, 
and yeah, this is about as small as they get. We've got some basic supplies around the outside. I wasn't sure how these things would look on the surface of a planet, honestly. I mean, we've seen them on ATV, but what we'd seen I wasn't really convincing me until I actually got a good look at one in person. And I quite like this. This looks like the kind of thing you would expect to see dropped on a planet. So I so said we've got packs of supplies through here. We've got, I'm assuming these are communications antennas mounted at the rear of the outpost. There's a bunch of small, I'm not sure what they're supposed to be, whether they're supposed to be sensors or what they are. And all the lighting works. Lots of little attention to detail on the externals as well. And I love how the underside of it and around the outside, it looks dusty. It looks like it's been, you know, on this planet and had a dust storm or two roll over the top of it. And it's just got a layer of cake dirt all over the uh, outpost. Oh, and our friend is boarding his ship. We do run into him again. Well, his ship at least. But, uh... Well, I'll decide if we put that on the end of the video or not, or whether or not we save it for the next one. Anyways, let's go inside. Once again, just using the interaction tool, it's just press F and it brings up a small cursor, and as you mouse over anything you can interact with, it gives you the inner thought options to activate them or not, and a simple left click will... And off he goes. A simple left click, uh, left click will give you the option of activating whatever features that particular item is. It'll also highlight the item so you can see exactly what you're about to click. So anyways, this is the inside of the Wolf Point Emergency Shelter. As we'll see, we've got medical supplies and medical equipment. Now, I did look through here, a couple of texture glitches over there. Again, PTU, to be expected. Um, I did have a look through here to see if there was anything that could be interacted with inside of the outpost. There isn't. However, the atmosphere is fine inside of here, so I could have taken off all of my breathing gear, my helmet and the rest, and been perfectly safe inside. So the atmosphere is definitely working. Now, even though there wasn't anything interactable inside, it was really interesting to go through and see the little attentions to detail inside of each of these outposts, especially considering that most of these outposts are actually procedurally generated. So... The, the system that they're using to actually do this is quite convincing at building what feels like a handcrafted environment. Now, of course, by procedural generation, I mean the outposts are procedurally generated, but their location is fixed, so that every time you come in at exactly the same point on the planet, this outpost will exist. Unless it becomes possible to destroy them, but that's a whole other thing. Anyways, the outpost here is run by Crusader Industries, and you'll notice there's a particular look and a particular color palette set that is used inside of this outpost. All of the Crusader-controlled um, outposts on the planet used this exact same sort of a look, but it's not universal to all of the outposts. I've run into mining outposts ran by different groups. They've got a completely different look and color palette inside, different logos. Uh, Crusader Industries, of course, being the ones that run Port Olisa, so you'll see some similar there. Different outposts will look different depending on which companies actually run them. So at this point we've had a bit of a look around the inside. There isn't much to look at on Wolf Point but as I said it is just an emergency shelter so you wouldn't expect there to be much here. And on top of that it's also being run by a major corporation. It was likely built as a requirement for them having access to the Crusader system. By Crusader system I of course mean the gas giant and the moons of Crusader, not the star system which is Stanton. Anyways, a corporation forced to build an emergency shelter as a requirement for having access to an area is of course only going to put the bare minimum of necessities that are available or required in order to man such a station. So it makes sense that the emergency shelters would be rather spartan. So anyways, from this point there wasn't a huge amount to explore around this outpost. Well, I take that back, there was, but I wanted to do it with a transport. Uh, I didn't want to fly the ship around, I wanted to get on a dragonfly and have a look around the area. Of course, I don't have a dragonfly yet, but I do know where to get one. As I mentioned earlier on in the video, there is a nearby mining outpost that will allow me to spawn in ground vehicles, and a dragonfly will fit in the back of Cutlass Black now. It's about 250 kilometers away, it's going to take me about 20 minutes to get there, and it will be in the next video. Anyways, ladies and gents, Hope you enjoyed this one. Thank you very much for watching. 
Until next time, remember to click that like button, subscribe if you want to see more, and as always, fly smart, fly safe, and I'll catch you in the skies.